All right, welcome everyone to Graduating Bits, uh, where we have a very full schedule, so we're just going to jump right into it. Uh, we have 17 awesome people who are on the job market this year. And uh, first off, we're going to be starting with Abhijit, who's currently at Oculus and is on the, interestingly, the PhD program uh, job market. Go ahead, Abhijit. Hello, everyone. I'm Abhijit, and I'll be talking about uh, myself. Uh, and uh, like any good talk, I'm going to start by explaining the title. So this is how you pronounce my name. Uh, it's a b j a b j mudi gonda mudi gonda, and in Telugu, which is my mother tongue, it's a language from South India. It's uh, spelled like this. Uh, and yeah, as Gautam mentioned, I'm uh, I find a PhD program this cycle, and I didn't realize that this is mostly for uh, people on the real job market. But nonetheless, uh, here I am. Uh, my research interests are uh, mostly in theoretical computer science. Uh, Unsurprisingly, I interested in lots of all things quantum, PCBs and unique games, analytic methods in TCS, and uh, fine grained algorithms in complexity. And uh, I also have done some number theory, and I'm especially interested in analytic number theory, arithmetic statistics, and automorphic forms. Uh, so what I've actually done, uh, I just in the previous session uh, talked about uh, Laura Baum that I worked on with uh, Ryan Williams at MIT, and that's on linear time quantum NP against small space. And in particular, the theorem is that linear time quantum classical Merlin or theorem key ram can't be uh, simulated by a small space O of n to the c time rams for c less than about 2.366. We also showed some wire bounds against small space randomized machines in this work. Uh, so on linear time ma on a ram and on linear time qc ma on a q ram against probabilistic rams. Uh, in number theory, uh, I won't detail this theorem, but basically uh, uh, with Benjamin Matsuki at Boston University, uh, I, I worked on uh, an asymptotic for how many quadratic number fields have some property that we care about. The lower bound is known already, but we uh, got the upper bound and in fact the precise asymptotic constant. And there are some other independently interesting analytic number theory results in this paper. Uh, right now, I'm an uh, OS engineer working at Oculus. And uh, in research, I'm thinking about quantum error correcting codes, some are groups and quadratic twist families. and I'm also trying to think about arithmetic circuit with lower bounds and using some techniques that combine number theory and complexity theory. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to start a PhD in math or CS in fall 21. Uh, and I finished my undergrad at MIT uh, as a member of the class of 2019. Uh, yeah, I guess here are some photos of me doing not, not stuff. So this is me seeing my college acapella group. I think this is the last chord of the last piece of my last concert. Uh, this is street food in. Uh, Hyderabad, India, where I was born. And uh, this is me in uh, the Salar de Uyuni in uh, Bolivia, where I went in 2019, don't worry, uh, for uh, after graduation. Uh, cool, thank you. Awesome, thank you. Uh, next up is Supratim uh, at IIT Gandhinagar, and uh, he's on the job market for postdoc positions. Could you please share screen now, please? Perfect. Can see you. Uh, go ahead or see your slides. Whenever you're ready, Supratim. Ah, uh, sorry, sorry, because I think I was mute. Hi, I'm Supratim from IIT Gandhinagar, India. I work on online courses for various machine learning algorithms, supervised by Professor Anirvan Das Gupta. So uh, many of you might know uh, what is Coursera, but just for the sake, let me just tell you briefly. So Coursera is basically a small representative of the data such that if you run any learning method on this Coursera, then the result you would get is more or less the same if you run the algorithm on the entire data. So, so here in our case, the Coursera is nothing but a uh, weighted subsample of the data. So uh, here is a... Uh, here is a small glimpse of the research that we have done in this area. So, uh, so for the case of tensor factorization and LP subspace embedding, we give various online algorithms that create score sets such that the guarantees of these score sets beats the uh, state of the art results in terms of uh, sampling size, uh, working space and, uh, and running time. We presented this paper in ICM last year we also presented one more paper uh, where we talk about code sets for, for regularized regression. But basically, um, 
uh, when you apply a regularizer on a on a regression, what you expect is that the corset size would would reduce. But uh, here we show that it is impossible to get a um, corset size. Uh, I, I mean, a smaller corset size for a lasso problem compared to the corset size of a least square regression. Uh, in case of a clustering problem, um, we have shown online algorithms to create corsets for clustering based on Bregman divergences. For the same problem, we also give corsets whose, uh, which is non-parametric in nature, as in the size of the corset is um, independent of the dimension of your input point, as well as key, the number of uh, clusters you are expecting uh, in the data. So, um, so yeah. So in here, um, our uh, algorithms are online in the nature because for every incoming point, uh, our sampling decisions are taken uh, without looking at the next input point. So yeah, um, his. I mean, and uh, these are a couple Thank of. Thank you, Super uh, Like I said, I have. Uh, we have to stop after yeah. two minutes for each. Sure, um, sure. Uh, the next one sure. will be uh, Gopinath Mishra. Yes. Uh, can you also see my slides? Yep, this is fine. Yeah. Hi, everyone. This is Gopinath Misra. I am a graduate student at the Indian Statistical Institute. Broadly, my research is in randomized algorithms with uh can't hear you anymore. Uh, I don't hear either. Uh, Gopinath, can you say something? Hello? Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, if you're fine. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, so my work on sublinear time algorithm or query complexity is on both local and global query models for graphs. In local query models, where we get some local information through each query, I worked on two problems. First, it is about query complexity of global minimum cut in general graph model. Second, uh, gra uh, tolerant graph isomerism problem in dense graph model. Apart from local query, as I have mentioned, I also worked on global query where we, we get some global information via each, uh, each query. So using global query, uh, query we, st we have studied uh, triangle counting, hyperedge counting, and parameterized fitting set in the uniform hypergraph problem. I also did uh, uh, these three works in sublinear space, that is streaming algorithm. First one in this, in this slide is about uh, uh, about the streaming, streaming complexity of some basic geometric problem. The second one is about study of the uh, graph coloring problem, a variant of black graph coloring problem in vertex arrival stream, where the graph as well as the coloring function on the vertices arrive in a stream. The third one in this slide is about study of subgraph deletion and uh, minor deletion problem uh, in different graph streaming, uh, streaming models. Apart from work on sublinear time and sublinear space algorithm, I also work, I did work in communication complexity. We considered the classical set dizziness problem where the pairs get inputs from a known bounded digit dimension set system. And in this case, we resolved the query complex, uh, communication complexity up to log factor. So this slide shows five of my published work uh, in the area of uh, sublinear algorithm. And all these things are going to be part of my thesis. Apart from sublinear algorithm, I got a chance to work uh, a little on discrete mathematics and uh, metric embedding problem, where uh, I, I was fortunate to get this, uh, these four publications. Apart from these publications in sublinear algorithms and uh, discrete mathematics metric embedding, I have also some unpublished work currently about uh, 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 work which are either submitted or going to be submitted uh, in the news near future. So now I would like to conclude my talk by saying that 
i am about to finish my phd in the near future and currently looking for a postdoctoral position broadly in area of randomized algorithm specifically uh, i would be fortunate if i get some postdoc position all right thank you um can we continue with shaswas please hi um just going to share my screen So I'm Shashwa. I'm doing my. I'm finishing my PhD at Stanford. My advisor is Mary Wooters, and I'm moving to Google in a couple of months. But I'm very interested in you know staying engaged with the theory community, and I thought I'd share like a small aspect of like my research with you guys. So I work on error correcting codes, but this talk is very short, so I'm not going to be able to tell you anything about errors or their correction. But I can still explain some kinds of problems I'm interested in. So a code is just a subset of all strings over an alphabet of length, uh, all strings of length n over an alphabet sigma, and the rate is kind of a proxy for its size. It's just the log of its size divided by the block length. And in this talk, we'll think of the alphabet always as f q. So you can think of a code as just a subset over a high-dimensional vector space. And I study the combinatorial properties of error correcting codes. So if you study combinatorics, you often know that random objects have very ideal properties. So we should study random ensembles of codes to sort of get a sense of what is possible with error correcting codes. So a very natural thing to study is just a completely random code, which is you just pick a subset of a certain size completely random um, for, in which every point is independently chosen completely randomly of each other. Or you can study slightly more structured subsets, which are, for example, random subspaces um, amongst all the subspaces of some given co-dimension. Or you can study even smaller subsets of random subspaces, which like, for example, LDPC codes, which it doesn't really matter what they are. But you can think of all three of these things as successive de-randomizations. Completely random codes are very random. Random linear codes are random, but less so. And LDPC are further less random. So. What kind of properties do I actually care about these codes? These questions are very simple. I might ask questions like, how much does one of these codes from these ensembles intersect with a Hamming ball? How much does it intersect in, you know, with you know, a combinatorial rectangle? And can we really quantifiably understand the differences between these very simple objects in these very simple ways? So what's really cool is when we think about properties of error correcting codes chosen from these random ensembles, they often undergo a phase transition. By, what, by that, I mean that if you look at a code of a certain rate or size, there is a, a, a given a property, the probability that a, a random code of that rate satisfies this probability is close to zero until it immediately jumps to one beyond that rate. So we call this a phase transition. So in my research, I'm able to show that for very natural properties, which are very large classes of properties, codes like the properties undergo phase transition. And we can actually really simply characterize the rate at which these phase transitions occur. How simple is this characterization? Well, simple enough for maybe a five minute talk, but maybe not a three minute talk. Um, and we get lots of cool results. We get results about you know, fine grained information about the geometry of these high dimensional subsets and subspaces. And we show certain new results about LDPC codes, which basically says that this de-randomization doesn't lose anything from completely random linear codes. And we open up some new ideas, new avenues for constructing linear time encodable and decodable codes, which achieve the decodable Thank you, Shaswat. Uh, if we could proceed with Jasper. Yep. Uh, can you hear um, me? Yeah, just as a heads up, I think I'll start giving people a 30 second warning. Go ahead. Yep, I'm screen sharing right now. There we go. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jasper Lee. I'm a final year student at Brown, advised by Paul Valiant. Uh, I'm currently on the market for a postdoc position. And today I want to tell you about my research interests, which uh, focus on data efficiency uh, of algorithms. Now, because we only have three minutes, please ex excuse me that I'll be using my fast uh, teaching voice uh, for this. Um, so I'm interested in both uh, foundational and classical problems, as well as uh, problems in new models. So let me highlight two of my recent results, uh, both with my advice at Paul. First, uh, we resolve a fundamental problem in statistics, uh, namely, how do we optimally uh, estimate the mean of a real value distribution? Um, the standard solution is to just use the empirical mean, namely, you sum up all your samples and normalize it, and then we use tail bounds to analyze it. 
the issue uh, with this kind of approach is that different tail bounds actually give you different convergences and require you to make different kinds of assumptions about the distribution. And in fact, the convergences are all suboptimal. So we settled this problem by giving an estimator with convergence that is not only big O type, but we even get the right constant uh, parameterized by the variant. And moreover, our algorithm is uh, simple to describe and computable in linear time, and therefore is actually applicable in practice. Um, this work is currently in submission uh, with a draft on archive already. I'm really proud of this work and would be very happy to talk more about this uh, offline. So let me move on to a, another result uh, in a new model that is inspired by crowdsourcing, uh, where crowdsourcing has this really crucial aspect that the answers we get from the crowd are typically unreliable and noisy. So the problem we're interested in is, uh, is uh, given a database, we want to use crowdsourcing to estimate the amount of wrong data in the database. For example, uh, what's highlighted in red right here using the fewest crowdsourcing tasks. Um, this problem can be theoretically modeled as a population of coins where we are trying to estimate the fraction of coins with positive bias. And we want to do this by flipping the coins as few times as possible. Um, one of the main challenges of working on this project is that the algorithms in this model can be really adaptive. So our result shows that uh, give tight, a uh, big O tight bounds, we show a, an optimal adaptive algorithm uh, also with experiments to back up its performance as well as a tight, fully adaptive uh, lower bound. And we also show a separation between the performance of adaptive and non-adaptive algorithms for this problem in this model. Um, this paper is appearing in SODA. Um, in fact, I'll be talking more about this on Sunday. So uh, please uh, feel free to, to come. Let me end this by uh, mentioning some of the other works I've done. Uh, beyond statistical problems, I'm also interested in uh, computational concerns. So at the beginning of my PhD, I've also worked on uh, optimizing star convex seconds. functions. So star convex functions are a family that really vastly generalizes convex functions. And these functions can be really weirdly discontinuous. And even for these like very weird function family, we give a polytime algorithm for optimizing them. Uh, recently with other co-authors, I've also worked on up approximating the maximum of Gaussian kernel density estimates. So I don't think I've run out of time. This is all I have uh, with, with the time. If you're interested uh, in the work I've done, I'd really love to talk to you. Um, Thank yep, you. Thanks. Nicole? Uh, Nicole, are you there? Uh, yep, cool. Uh, OK. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Nicole. Um, I'm a final year PhD student at MIT. My advisor is Virginia Vasilevska-Williams, and I'm on the market for a postdoc. So uh, in my research, we consider very large graphs. And what I mean by that is like, if you gave me an algorithm that runs in polynomial time or even like cubic time or quadratic time, we could say, you know, this is gonna be too slow for this very large graph. And so two themes of my research that fall under this uh, idea are theme number one, approximation algorithms for problems in P meaning that if you have a problem that runs uh, with an algorithm that runs in, let's say quadratic time, what we would like to be able to do is to get an approximation algorithm that runs much faster, let's say in linear time. Another theme of my research is on dynamic algorithms. So let's say your graph here is changing over time and we would like to be able to update our solution in order to reflect the changes in the graph. And again, because the graph is so large, we don't have time to recompute the whole solution from scratch every time the graph changes. And so we would like to instead maintain a very efficient data structure that allows us to update the solution. So I'll talk about one particular project um, which falls under theme one here. So uh, also I'm, I'm interested in both in upper, upper bounds and lower bounds. So the project that I'll talk about is uh, the diameter problem. So the, the diameter is just simply the largest distance in the whole graph. So we're interested in getting an algorithm that computes just the largest distance in the whole graph. And it turns out that the best exact algorithm that we know to do this is just to run all pair shortest paths, find all of the distances, take the largest one and output that one. And it's also known that you can't get a significantly faster algorithm than this under the strong exponential time hypothesis. So that motivates the question of trying to get even faster algorithms, but we're allowed to settle for an approximation. 
So there have been many papers on this topic and some of them even have been, there's been a lot of work on this even just in the last uh, couple of months. So our goal here is to be able to output a solution that's almost the right length, but not quite the right, the right length. So it turns out there are several algorithms to do this. You can get time accuracy trade-off algorithms, for example, a two approximation in linear time, et cetera. Um, and my work on this project, on this problem with collaborators has been mostly on showing that in addition to getting a time accuracy trade-off algorithms, you can also get time accuracy trade-off conditional lower bounds. Uh, and that's all I have. Thanks a lot for listening. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Nicole. Um, next up, we have Suhail. Right, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, are you going to share? All right. Yeah, I'm sharing a screen. Can you see it? Yes. All right. So uh, I'm Suhail Sharif, and I have nearly completed my PhD. My thesis just needs to be reviewed. And it's under Arkadev Chattopadhyay at TIFR in Mumbai. And this is my thesis title. Uh, as you can see, it's based on query complexity lower bounds, and it has applications in communication complexity and quantum optimization. So I'm currently on the market uh, for a postdoc position. And I thought I would just uh, say something about my interests. So the stuff that I've worked until now have mainly been in query complexity and communication complexity. and the most seductive aspect of these is their relation to algebraic measures. It, it's always nice to think about. And uh, while thinking about this, we had, uh, I, along with some co-authors, noticed that the log approximate rank conjecture is false. And this is not just an elegant result, but it also, uh, it has implications for stuff like quantum versus randomized communication complexity. If you want a separation between these two, then you need to really understand when is it that communication complexity is not uh, exactly the measure of approximate rank. Now, in the study of quantum versus randomized communication complexity, XOR functions play a huge role and they're not that well understood, which is why we also look at parity decision trees. Uh, randomized parity decision trees are also not very well understood. And there's just so many connections in these areas that one can explore. Uh, just looking at parity decision trees brings up combinatorial questions about the hypercube and subspaces. And yeah, so these are, I, my interest is in all of these related topics. Uh, further, I'm interested in quantum query complexity for the insights that you can get with uh, quantum query algorithms. And in fact, one of the papers that uh, one of the results that I have is going to be presented tomorrow here at ITCS. Uh, do check it out. I won't be presenting it because it's around 4 a.m. for me, but my co-author Robin Kothari will be presenting it. Um, yeah, that's about it. I'm also interested in looking at uh, just general things in computational complexity, anything that halting problems and, and everything is quite elegant in computational complexity. So. I'm open for anything in that. All right, uh, thank you for listening and back to you, Doug. Perfect, thank you, Suhail. Um, next up is Peter Dixon. Uh, Hello. Hey, you're good. Okay, uh, I'm Peter. Um, I mostly work on randomized algorithms from a complexity perspective. Uh, I'm currently looking for uh, postdoc positions um, so what I've been working on lately is pseudo determinism. That's where you have a random algorithm, like it's still random, but it looks deterministic in the sense that it consist consistently outputs the same value. Like if you think about a prime generating algorithm, this one will consistently give you the same prime number. And so the main question is what can you actually do pseudo deterministically? Um, so we had a neat connection to circuit lower bounds, where if you can do a Stockmeyer's algorithm pseudo deterministically, then you get new circuit lower bounds for a ZPP with NP Oracle and truth table queries. Not only that, but we can get really close to pseudo deterministic. We can get it to output a constant number of solutions, like from a constant size set pseudo deterministically. 
And then my talk at this conference was on a completeness concept for pseudodeterminism, where if you can estimate collision probability uh, pseudodeterministically, uh, that lets you get a lot of pseudodeterministic algorithms, in particular, um, anything with a constant number of solutions you can make fully pseudodeterministic. Um, other stuff I've worked on, uh, I did some computational complexity distribution testing connections. So let's say you've got two sampleable distributions. You want to know if they're similar or uh, not similar. It's uh, probably the like the basic problem for distribution testing. Um, so by studying this problem, we were able to show that non-interactive perfect zero knowledge is unconditionally contained in uh, SBP, which is kind of like a, it's BPP, but with a worse probability. Um, but you can't push that much farther unless you can get some non-relativizing results. We were able to give oracles separating uh, the interactive version. And you also can't get NIPZK in co-SVP. And as a nice corollary, this uh, gives you a relativized separation between PZK and non-interactive PZK. Um, I've also done stuff with a multi-pass randomness. Um, so normally, if you're looking at space-bounded randomized computation, you look at the random string one way. Like, you only get to read it once. You can't remember it for free. Um, so what happens if we uh, remove that restriction? Um, and one reason for studying this is that we showed that if you can de-randomize in polynomial time, uh, log space multipass. 30 seconds. Uh, then you can get an unconditional de-randomization, a weak one, but unconditional for time-bounded classes. And we can de-randomize it in log space, but we need a non-uniform linear advice. Uh, yeah, that's all I've got. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Peter. Um, next up is William. Uh, one sec. Let's see. There we go. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm William Hosa. Um, my advisor is David Zuckerman. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the University of Texas at Austin and I'm looking to graduate this May. And after that, I'm interested in a postdoc position. I'm, I'm on the market for postdoc positions starting in the fall. Um, I'm especially interested in pseudorandomness and derandomization. Uh, my, my dream would be to prove L equals BPL unconditionally to derandomize space bounded computation to show that random bits are not necessary for efficient, space efficient computation. Um, this is a dream I share with plenty of other researchers, though. Uh, so let me just give you an idea of, of, of uh, you know, some things that I've done failing that. Uh, I, I like to work on pseudorandom generators. Uh, I like unconditional constructions of pseudorandom generators. So, for example, uh, Dean, Duran, Puya, Hatami, and I uh, designed the first uh, near-optimal pseudorandom generators for read once AC0. Uh, Pseudorandom generators, I guess, are, are like the most standard approach to proving a derandomization theorem, something like L equals BPL. Um, and I think they're also really elegant, you know, mathematically, I, I think they're really elegant uh, constructions. I'm also interested in like less conventional approaches for derandomization. Uh, so for example, um, hitting sets. A hitting set is a sort of a one-sided version of a pseudorandom generator. Um, and David Zuckerman and I uh, uh, designed hitting sets for RL with optimal dependence on epsilon, this, this threshold parameter. Um, and then in a follow-up work, uh, Quan Chang and I uh, proved that optimal hitting sets for RL actually can be used you know, in a non-trivial way uh, to de-randomize BPL. And so I think those two works kind of go together. Um, so yeah, I mean, more generally, I'm interested in like creative uh, approaches to de-randomization. Um, I also, I'm, I mean, I'm happy to work on problems that aren't, you know, related to pseudorandomness and derandomization. I, more generally, I, I like complexity theory and the analysis of Boolean functions. 
um, anything that has sort of mathematically elegant techniques and then well-motivated computational uh, 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 interpretations, I, I, I think is really appealing. Uh, so that's all, thanks for listening. Cool, thank you very much, uh, William. Um, next up is Yi Ding Feng. Yep, go ahead, whenever you're ready. Cool. Hello, everyone. This is Yi Ding Feng. I'm a fifth year PhD student from Northwestern Computer Science, and my research interests include American design, online algorithm, and machine learning. And I'm excited about the problem from other areas like economics and operation research and try to solve them from a perspective of computer scientists. And I'm very fortunate to be advised by Jason Harlan. So next, let me give you some taste about the problem I'm interested in. So metric design is an area originally from economics, but now it's become also popular in computer science. And from a computer science perspective, metric design is some kind of multi-party computation where different parties have their own data. For example, here, we want to allocate an apple to one of the two agents and different agents will have different value for this apple. And those value can be sold as their own data. And in the multi-party computation, so there are two major concerns. First, who should be doing which part of the computation? And second, how can we guarantee that they will do it correctly? Well, in metric design, people answer the second question pretty well. Specifically, let's assume that the player are rational. In this sense, we can try to implement some of the game theoretic incentive policy. However, for the first question, the literature in system design suggests that we should ask all the party to do some part of their computation, because in this way, the final protocol will be both simple and robust. On the other hand, for the mechanism design literature, people would prefer that only the central, central mechanism should do the computation. In other words, most of the results in mechanism design will consider truthful mechanism, where all the player will report their true information to the mechanism and the other computation will be response by the mechanism itself. And in the, in the literature, most of the results focus on the truth mechanism because it's easy to do the analysis. However, on the other side, we have, we have non truth mechanism where all the player need to compute their own strategy in the equilibrium. In other words, they need to respond for some of the computation. And, and, and usually those non truth mechanisms are hard to analyze. However, in practice, we know that non truth mechanisms are pretty po popular. For example, Google, Google Ads just switched their protocol to the first price auction, which is a non truth mechanism. And therefore, a natural question we can ask here is that, are there any theoretical evidence that non truth mechanisms are better than truthful mechanisms? Because if it is the case, it suggests that our community should pay more attention and spend more effort seconds. on this area. And the answer is yes. So in a joint work with Jason Harlan and Yin Kai Li, we show that in, a, in prior independent mechanism design, which is a standard framework in the literature, there exists non-revelation, there is this non-trivial relation gap. In other words, the optimal non-truthful mechanism is strictly better than the truthful mechanism. And that's it, thank you. Thank you, Yiding. Um, next up is Vagos. Nice, thank you for organizing G. Mm -hmm. Let me share my screen. All right, you're good. Uh, you can see my screen, right? Yeah, perfect. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, I'm Vagos. I graduated from Stanford um, last summer, and now I'm a postdoc in Google New York. And I want to tell you a little bit about my work. The first thing I want to tell you is that um, data um, contain hier hierarchies, they have hierarchical structure that is sometimes useful and um, we care about this hierarchical structure, but we're not yet at the point where we have a good understanding of our toolbox and our um, methods that are used for detecting those hierarchical structures. You can think of examples from social networks, recommendations, text analysis, and the, that they have some hierarchical uh, structure. Now, I want to convince you about the fact that data have hierarchical structure using a few examples. The one has to do with biology, and um, it starts in uh, 
1831, when Charles Darwin went to the Galapagos Islands to study the animals that lived there. And uh, what he observed is he observed several species that shared some differences, shared, shared some similarities, and uh, they had some differences. And he understood that just simply creating a grouping of those species, what we would call nowadays clustering, would not be enough to depict the detailed information and relationships that uh, uh, these species have. So Darwin, um, he thought a little bit about that, and he came up with this um, draft, which is a hierarchical tree that describes different, uh, several relationships among species. For example, if we have species A, B, C, D here, we can see that A is further away from the rest of the species, so it's less related to them, whereas B and C are closely related. And as a fun fact, out of the 500 pages that Darwin uh, had in his book, The Origins of Species, this is the single uh, figure that appears. So he really thought it was important and it was the only one in the book. Now, uh, biological networks are not the only ones that contain hierarchies. Digital networks also have hierarchies. Here is a, an example of the internet graph. And you can see trees and dendrograms inside it. Uh, the final example I want to show is from deep learning. Uh, so we now know empirically that deep neural networks that have several layers, they can detect hierarchical features. For example, you can see here that different layers can detect maybe edges, other layers can detect corners or parts of wheels in the car, and uh, the last layer will detect high level features like mirrors or wheels and things like that. In my work, I tried, I tried to develop a theory of hierarchical clustering that was mainly my PhD thesis on. Um, thank you. And um, this is on the realm of unsupervised learning. And the realm of, in the realm of deep learning, I'm trying to understand why depth is important. And I use a variety of tools like uh, continuous and discrete optimization, hyperbolic geometry, and uh, also dynamical systems. Thank you very much. Awesome. And I would like also, yeah, I would okay. like also to acknowledge all my collaborators for this uh, work. Thank all you right. very much. Thank you, Vagos. Um, next up is Fangi. Cool, you're good. Whenever you're ready. Uh, Fungi, I can't hear you. Is it good right now? All right, yeah, now it's good. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, I'm Fungi. Uh, I'm currently a postdoc at Harvard, and I got my PhD in Michigan. My research interest is about multi-agent systems. Here I use the term agents in its broadest sense. It can be a group of people, an automata, or multiple neural networks. For instance, we can consider a group of people deliberating and making collective decisions. This problem is known as uh, social learning, where we can design mechanisms to help a collection of automata to aggregate their information and make a collective predictions. This kind of problem can be known as uh, federated learning. And let me see how can I... So tomorrow I'm going to share my work about how to create in incentivize compatible mechanism to help multi-agent systems to collect their and share their information. So I'm going to use these three minutes to talk about the other parts. Uh, that is dynamics on multi-agent systems. Example of my research includes uh, decentralized routing in social networks, information cascades, and social learnings. So let me give you one of my examples. Uh, uh, a very common, a very important problem in a social network is why society is divided. And uh, I'm trying to, my work is trying to model these phenomena through the lens of multi-agent systems. So uh, we model the agents as uh, nodes in some social networks and they interact with their neighbors and use some very simple rules, updates their opinions and this kind of process is called, often called interactive particle systems. And we want to ask how long does this kind of random process take to reach consensus? So if our graph has some certain structure, which is often true in a social network, we can embed the whole process in a low dimensional space. For example, if we have two communities, then we can embed the process in the 
uh, in two-dimensional space. And moreover, as the number of agents increase, we can often reduce the problem. The problem can be uh, often approximated by some dynamical systems. And in this case, the num this is a very natural setting because we often consider the number of agents very large. And this idea is called a mean field approximations. However, there may be some fixed point in these dynamical systems and such that the solution of these mean field approximations is constant solutions. 30 seconds. And this is not, uh, however, the corresponding random process should not stop there forever, although the mean field approximation stop, uh, would stay, stay there forever. So uh, we show a version of uh, escaping zero point results saying that if your noise is if your noise is large enough, then you can escape that in a very timely manner. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Feng Yi. Um, next up is Wei Ming Feng. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Wei Ming from Nanjing University. Uh, my research focuses on sampling algorithms for Gibbs distributions. So the Gibbs distribution is widely used to model joint distributions defined by local interactions. A central research problem is how to draw random samples from the Gibbs distribution. This problem is closely related to approximate counting and the inference tasks. So my research topic is to design efficient sampling algorithms for Gibbs distributions. By efficient, okay. I mean the algorithm should have certain good features such as distributed, dynamic, fast, and so on. So we first studied the distributed sampling. The graphical model now becomes a distributed network. Each vertex is a computer. They can communicate with their neighbors in each round. And uh, upon termination, each of them output a random value such that their joint distribution follows the target Gibbs distribution. We proposed some algorithms. We also proved the equivalence between sampling and counting in distributed computing model. And we discovered a computational phase transition phenomena in distributed sampling. We also studied the dynamic sampling problem. In this problem, we are given a distribution and a random sample. Then we are given an update that modifies the distribution into a new distribution. The task is to obtain a new sample from the new distribution with a small incremental cost. So we give two techniques for this problem. The first one is called the conditional Gibbs technique. This technique turns the rejection sampling into a dynamic sample. And it is also related to the spatial mixing property of the Gibbs distribution. Another technique combines coupling and the data structure uh, this, this technique turns the MCMC method into a dynamic sampler. The paper will, is accepted by ITCS, and Kun uh, will give the talk tomorrow. Another problem is the sampling Lovas local lemma. The algorithmic Lovas local lemma aims to find a solution. A famous example is the most title algorithm. But this task asks us to sample a uniform solution under a relaxed condition of the local lemma. We propose a new Markov chain approach for this problem. The main advantage of our approach is that the algorithm is very fast. The running time is close to the linear. So in the future, I want to get a more deeper understanding of these sampling problems. I plan to study the Markov chain theory, sampling Lovas local lemma, uh, problems in the new models, and other uh, related topics in the theoretical computer science. So I will be graduated soon, and I'm now looking for a postdoc position. That's all. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much, Feng Yi. Or oh, sorry, Wei, Wei Ming. Um, next up, we have Kiran Kumar. Can you hear me? Yep. Can you hear you? Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kiran Kumar Shirabu. Uh, I am a fifth year PhD student at Stanford University uh, and I'm jointly advised by Professor Moses Charikar and Professor Aaron Sitford. Uh, my broad research interests are in theoretical computer science, more specifically in building statistical and computational foundations of data science. I'm also interested in using these tools to understand problems in natural and social sciences. 
I'm currently looking for postdoc positions. So due to interest of time, uh, I'll just provide a broad overview of my research. Uh, so uh, uh, my primary research so far has been in understanding statistical and computational questions related to property estimation problem. Uh, in the property estimation problem, there is a hidden distribution and you are given access to this distribution through IID samples. And the goal is to build estimators that take minimum number of samples and estimate a, pro a specific property of this hidden distribution. So far in the literature, people have come up with property specific estimators. And in our work, uh, we have uh, through a series of work, uh, building upon some of the previous works, we have come up with an efficient universal estimator for symmetric property estimation. By universal estimator, I mean uh, one estimator for all the properties. Uh, so uh, to prove such a result, uh, we came up with first efficient algorithm to compute uh, something called as an approximate profile maximum likelihood distribution. Uh, it's closely related to uh, permanence. Uh, and so this profile maximum likelihood distribution was introduced by Orletsky et al. back in 2004, but uh, no efficient algorithm existed for computing it. Uh, and this particular question of computation of approximate uh, profile maximum likelihood distribution was posed as an open question by Acharya et al. and in the Fox sublinear workshop as well. Uh, I have also worked on several other problems. Uh, for instance, uh, we have modeled and trail formulation and shown some interesting properties of our model. Through analysis and simulation, we actually show, uh, uh, give a very plausible explanation for the field observations of uh, Chandrasekhar et al. made back in 2019. They showed that uh, ants actually uh, tend to find a path between the nest and the food source with minimum number of nodes. Through our model, we were able to uh, provide explanation for such a finding. I've also designed algorithms for efficient operation of two-sided matching markets. Uh, prior, prior to our work, most of the work has been in the one-sided matching markets. So these two-sided matching markets are central problem in economics with applications in labor markets, uh, home rentals, and many other, many other areas. Uh, currently, I'm working on some COVID-related projects. Uh, uh, I'm currently collaborating with LA School District on building models and understanding the impact of various testing strategies uh, to safely reopen schools. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much, uh, Kun Kumar. Um, next up is uh, Simon. Is it Simon? Uh, yeah, yeah, correct. Okay, so this is me. So thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Simon and I'm a PhD student in computer science. So my advisors are Claire Mathieu and Hugo Jambert and I'm doing my PhD in France in Paris. So my PhD is about matching markets with random preferences. So I'm going to talk a bit about this later. And I will be probably defending in fall 2021, if everything goes well. So to describe my research interests, so here is a list of three IPCS sessions I'm really looking forward to. So that's, there, is, there was the, the matching session uh, yesterday that I really enjoyed because it's really related to what I'm doing in, uh, in my PhD. So there is a two algorithmic game theory uh, sessions because I, I want to do a, a postdoc in a field related to algorithmic game theory. And also the online and streaming algorithm session because I work and I'm working on some uh, project uh, like this. So let me give you a quick overview of my research with a, an example of, of results. So that was a, a paper at EC last year. And so here is uh, the model. So for this talk, I'm going to take the example of the job market for postdocs. So on the left, you have students. On the right, you have postdocs. And a link between a student and a postdoc means that uh, the, the field or the, the subject match and the two could be, could be match. So for the sake of modelization, we're going to say that agents are going to order the neighbors uniformly at random. And uh, to match students and postdocs, uh, there is two well-known procedures. So the student proposing uh, different acceptance and the postdoc proposing different acceptance. And one really interesting question would be to say, to ask what is the probability that this matching is going to be chosen? And here the, the, the probability comes from the, the randomness of the preferences of the agents 
not from the procedures because the two procedures are actually deterministic. And so what was the result? The result is that actually both procedures, so the, the student proposing and the postdoc proposing, which yield two different matching, actually output exactly the same uh, distribution. And in fact, this distribution can be computed. And yeah, that's it. So uh, let me go back to the first slide. And that's it for me. So if you, um, uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much, uh, Simon. Um, next up is uh, Nitin. Hi, can you see my screen? Yep, you're perfect. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Nitin Verma. Uh, I'm at the University of Haifa, and my research is uh, broadly about algorithms for massive data sets, uh, specifically focusing on the aspects of efficiency and corruption resilience. Uh, a little bit about me I'm a postdoc at the University of Haifa, mentored by Ilan Newman and Noga Ranzevi. Uh, before coming to Haifa, I was a PhD student at Boston University, where my advisor was Sofia Raskodnikova. Uh, and so when talking about algorithms for massive data sets, uh, one can often uh, model data sets as functions, code words, or graphs. And in our study, we consider both classical approximation algorithms and sublinear term algorithms. As is usual in any study of algorithms, there are several performance metrics to be considered, such as running time, memory efficiency, accuracy, and resilience to faults in data. And my focus so far has been on running time and resilience to data faults. And faults in data sets can be of two kinds, errors or wrong values, and erasures or missing values. And they can occur for various reasons. One could be issues in data collection. You're conducting a survey and participants either refuse to answer certain questions or give misinformation. Now, when data is being stored, some of it could be adversarially or accidentally deleted or corrupted. Now, a database administrator could also decide to hide certain data points to protect the privacy of the individuals concerned. Now, all of these uh, can be modeled as errors or erasures. And here is a summary of my work. Uh, in the context of sublinear term algorithms, the main contribution has been an initiation of the study of erasures uh, uh, in, for sublinear term algorithms. Uh, we have also studied the relationship between erasures and errors again in sublinear term algorithms. Uh, we have also uh, worked on identifying the right input parameters to express the complexity of sublinear term algorithms. Uh, and this has resulted in a lot of follow-up work. Uh, for approximation algorithms, uh, we have been interested in investigating the effects of small perturbations to the input on algorithm behavior. And I'll be talking about this uh, at SODA, this coming SODA. I have also some other work on graph spanners and some graph theoretic problems based out of bioinformatics. Just a concluding slide, I'm giving two upcoming talks. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, erasure resilient sublinear term graph algorithms. And at SODA, I'm going to talk about average sensitivity of graph algorithms. Uh, thank you. Thank you for listening. Awesome. Thanks a lot, uh, Nitin. Um, and we're on to our final one, uh, Vaibhav Karwe at uh, UIUC. Uh, is, the, is my screen visible? Yep. Uh, Hi, hello everyone. I am Vaibhav Karve from the Department of Mathematics at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, my advisor is Professor Anil Hirani. And uh, most of my PhD work is uh, revolving around this novel graph decision problem that we are calling graph sat. So as the name suggests, this sort of combines graph theory and the classical Boolean satisfiability that we all uh, are used to and we like. Uh, the idea is that SAT is a hard problem. So maybe instead of solving each instance of SAT, we can group multiple instances of SAT into uh, sort of clumps and associate an undirected, a single undirected graph with these groups of instances and solve it on the graph. So this turns it into a graph decision problem. Of course, the challenge is that uh, 
graph sat ends up being more complicated than sat so we get you get more structure but you pay in terms of uh, making the problem even more complicated than it was to begin with uh, and we have variants of graph sat uh, two satisfiability turns into what we call two graph sat so this uses simple graph uh three graphs three sat turns into three graph sat which uses multi hyper graphs so these can have edges between more than two uh vertices at a time and so the theory is complicated which is why it's a, a fun problem to work on our main results uh have been that two graph sat just like sat even though it is two sat just like uh, two sat even though it is more complicated still ends up having a polynomial time algorithm uh three graph, graph sat is genuinely more complicated and it is uh and uh, we we only have an exponential time algorithm we are working on trying to uh, sort of find better and more efficient algorithms for this problem uh all these results so i i just wanted to mention this all the results themselves and details can be found in uh, a paper that i published with my advisor uh in discrete applied math called the complete set of minimal simple graphs that support unsatisfiable two cnfs uh i can be contacted through uh all the details that are present on my website uh, i'm in my final year of phd so i'm currently on the job market for postdocs in both mathematics or in theory cs uh most of my interest and my work uh, revolve around computational graph theory because i do a lot of programming uh, in python and my my style of coming up with results is usually an experimental style where i'll i have some conjectures i'll run them experimentally uh, sort of on a computer and then try and prove those results using pen and paper uh, so i work around graph algorithms complexity analysis and this is my new found obsession which is uh, formal mathematics and interactive theorem proving especially using theorem provers like lean or cock that you might have heard of uh thank you for to gautam for giving me the opportunity to speak awesome thank you vibhav um yeah and that's it uh, we finished up and we have uh 3 minutes and 45 seconds to spare so thank you everyone all the speakers for presenting and uh cooperating with the time very restricted time we have and thank you to all the audience for coming um all these people are on one job market or the other so please uh uh yeah i uh, hope you found some interesting candidates and uh hire them all right so yeah we're just uh finishing up and uh the next session i'll direct you to the other room now where uh kira is going to be chairing the session on algorithmic game theory